Hello, my name's Tim Davies. A couple of days ago, I ran a session for the City of Hume Council in Melbourne in conjunction with the Homes Glen TAFE Self-Employment Service. The session was all around how to get started in online business, particularly an online retail business, how to sell products online. I work with a company called Zealous, and most of our clients are multi-channel, meaning that they sell on perhaps several websites, perhaps several marketplaces. Some of them also have physical stores and warehouses and point of sale systems. All of them have one thing in common, and that is that they want to succeed in selling products online. It might look complex from the outside, and there's some aspects of it that are. But today I'm going to break it down into really simple terms as to how to get started selling uh, products online. So whether you're starting a business or whether you've been going for a little while, I hope there's something useful in this for you. What I'm going to run through in the session today is a number of things. Firstly, we're going to have a look at how shopping has changed in the world around us, how we all shop, the advantages and disadvantages of selling online, how we can sell online, what you need to sell products online, how much it's going to cost, and where to put your effort for the best results. Back when I was a kid, I used to hate shopping. You see, my, my visions of shopping at that stage were being dragged around by my parents from street to street, from car park to car park, usually on a Thursday night or a Friday night, late night shopping. Sometimes it was cold, sometimes it was hot. We'd go to one store and we'd look for, I don't know, a washing machine or a fridge or a lounge or something like that. We'd look at the five different options they had there, didn't like any of them. And then I'd get dragged around to the next shop, which was on the other side of town. We'd struggle to find a park. We'd have to go through the traffic. And then we'd see three more products there we'd already seen in the other place, but they were more expensive. And then we'd have to go back to the other place and have a look again. And then we'd go on, go somewhere. It, you get the idea. It was a bit of an ordeal. You were limited to the range of products that you could see in the physical shops that were in your town. And that was pretty much it. And if you didn't like those prices, well, too bad. That was my memory of shopping when I was a kid. These days, shopping looks a little different, perhaps a little more like this. And when we see people on the train or the bus or walking down the street or sitting in the park, dare I say it, sitting on the toilet, we tend to shop at all sorts of times of day all over the place. But what's interesting is we're not shopping on one continuous mission. We tend to shop in bits and pieces. We'll take a bit of a look through social media. We'll take a look on Google. We'll go, an idea will pop into our head and we'll go and look for something. Our shopping today tends to be a little bit impulsive it's whatever pops into our head at the time i've been standing in physical shops saw seen a product on the shelf and had the idea in my head i wonder if i could get that online either at a better price or from somewhere else or a different brand or an alternative we tend to shop in little doses or micro shopping as we call it also our shopping tends to not be quite as linear as it used to be back in the physical uh, world of course we still shop on uh, still shopping the physical world today but what it used to be like when i was a kid these days we will use our mobile phone to start shopping and then perhaps at lunchtime we might jump onto the computer. Maybe we might physically go to a shop to go and have a look at something. We might end up buying the thing on a tablet. We're all over the place and that's okay because we can choose where we want to do it and when. One of the great things about shopping online is that we can compare prices. We can look at different products, alternatives. We can see brands that might not be around the corner but might be on the other side of the world. And as technology continues to evolve and grow, there's a lot more opportunity for us to actually shop in all sorts of different ways, whatever suits us and whenever suits us. So what does that mean for you and me? If you wanna set online, what is the real opportunity here? Well, let's run through a couple of statistics. But first, the first rule of retail you may have heard is that the customer's always right. Well, I'm here to tell you that's not true at all. The first rule of retail is, of course, be where the customer is. The customers are the ones with the money. You want them to give you the money. You need to be where the customers are. So where are customers today? Australia Post tells us around 81% of Australians are shopping online today. And last year, they spent around 63, almost $64 billion. And when you're just getting started in business, that's a number that kind of doesn't mean anything. But it's a big number, which is obviously a good thing, because if you're looking to get into selling products online, it's a good space to be in because there's a lot of money going through that particular sector. Currently in Australia, just under 20% of all retail sales are happening online. So now we've got a bit of an idea as to the size of the opportunity. Why do we like to shop online? Well, as I shared before from my experience in my youth, it can be a little frustrating being limited to the range of products and the range of vendors and retailers within one geographical area. 
the great thing about shopping online is that we can literally shop anywhere in the world at any time, in any time zone, at any time of day, middle of night when we can't sleep, it doesn't matter. We don't have to worry about the traffic. We don't have to worry about parking. We don't have to worry about the extra fuel costs and the running costs of the car. We don't have to worry about catching public transport. We can do it wherever we are right now. There's no queues, no crowds, nobody pushing you around. Of course, it's going to save time because we can do it without the travel involved. We can do it right every, wherever we are at, the, at that particular point in time. And of course, distance is irrelevant. We're not limited to the shops that are within reach of our own home or, or our own workplace. We can shop anywhere in the world. And that also means that we can access a limitless range of products. So there's a lot of benefits for shopping online. In short, it's convenient, right? But remember we said before that about 20% of retail spending is happening online. That means that around 80% of retail spending is actually happening in physical shops. Okay, so let's just put some perspective onto this. You might say when you start a business that it's better off to start in a place that has the biggest opportunity. So surely spending effort and time in the 80% is going to give you a better result than on the 20%, right? A lot of businesses that I've spoken to have exactly that view. But I'm going to perhaps suggest something different. When you're looking at the 80% of retail, there's a couple of things you need to take into account. Let's do a quick comparison between the physical shop or the digital shop. With the physical shop, yes, you've got access to 80% consumer spend. However, the shop has a geographically limited audience. The people that can physically come to that location are people that live in the neighborhood or are passing through. So even if you're trying to access that 80% of physical retail spending, you're not going to get all 80%. You're only going to get that little tiny couple of percent that might be living around the area where you set up your physical shop. So it's not quite as rosy as it might seem on the surface. Obviously, with the physical shop, you also have limited space for stock. Once you've used up that space, that's it. You can't fit anymore. So you're going to have a limit on how many products you can offer your customers. You're going to have more competitors because there's lots of physical shops out there all competing, especially in shopping centers and shopping precincts. You're going to have some relatively higher startup costs. The reality is you've got to set up that store, do the shop fitting, get your staff, do the do the leases, the rental, uh, all of the the marketing and and the, the all of that stuff has to be paid for before you even get one customer walk through the door. So there's some high cost to start up with, and obviously there's higher running costs because you're going to have to hire premises or buy if you fortunate enough to do that in a place where customers are going to be able to get to you easy. It's got to be somewhere where there's parking, perhaps near public transport. And so your rent costs or your ownership cost of the property are going to be higher straight away just from that. What about an online shop in the digital space? Yes, you've only got around 20% consumer spend, but you are accessing all of that 20% from anywhere in Australia. Not only Australia, but you've also got an unlimited global audience. As soon as you're on the World Wide Web, anybody can reach you from anywhere in the world. So that's pretty exciting. There is no limit really to the product range that you can offer online. You might have physical space limits in your garage or your physical store or warehouse, wherever you're operating from, but you don't have to stock all of the products in your premises in order to be able to offer them to your customers. There are models around like drop shipping and just-in-time ordering that allow you to actually tap into the product range of other businesses that, uh, that where you don't actually physically store the products in your, uh, in your premises, in your warehouse. You're going to have less competitors online. There's around about 35, 36% of Australian retailers are currently in the online space. So it's still relatively early days at this point in time. The startup costs are generally lower. We'll go through some of those. And there's probably some lower running costs as well. And again, I'm going to run through that in a little more detail for you. If we have a look at the risk factor for both of those, operating a physical store is definitely much higher risk, much higher bar to cross to get in, much more expensive to get started with no promise of getting very much back at all. Whereas an online store is much lower risk, much easier to get into. And whilst you may not be tapping into as big a pool of the retail spend of Australian consumers, the reality is you're going to access all of that instead of just the small percentage of the 80% that are living close to where your store is set up. So there's a pretty good case there to set up an online store. So where do you start? What's it going to take to actually get started in online shopping? Well, there's actually quite a few things. I'm not going to go through all of those in depth. I could talk about this for hours. Sometimes I do. 
but there's a lot of things that you're going to need to pull together. And, and I've tried to summarize it on this screen here. You're going to need some software. You're going to need some way of recording the products that you have in stock, how many of them you've got, what your cost price is, what your margins are, your profit margins, what your selling prices are. If you're running discounts, what those discounts are, you're going to have to look at how many products you've sold. You're going to need some software to actually record all of that. Yes, when you start from day one, you can probably do it in a spreadsheet, but hopefully your business will get to a point where that won't be possible and you need something a little more sophisticated. Good news is there are some fairly inexpensive software solutions out there like Shopify, like Wix. There's a whole whole bunch of them out there that are really quite inexpensive to get started. Whether you stay on those long-term or not really depends on how your business grows and how complex or simple your business might happen to be. You're going to need a shopping cart online. So again, those platforms that I mentioned and many others will have a shopping cart that allows the customer to select what they want, put it in the cart, go to the cart, go through checkout, put their credit card details in, use their PayPal account, whatever payment that they're going to use and buy the products from you online. You're also going to need a delivery solution. Now, whilst you might in the early days perhaps just pack up the products that you've got and uh, pop them in the boot of the car and take them down to the local post office, the reality is you're not going to do that for very long, especially if your business is successful. You're going to need a way of actually generating those consignment labels on demand. You're going to need a way of actually fulfilling the products, generating the, the consignments and having them either picked up or being able to drop them off in bulk to your carrier. You're going to need some space, some facilities. That might be your garage, might be your kitchen to start with, but it might also be a warehouse. Depends on the size of your business and depends on how you're starting and it depends where it grows to. You're going to need some space of some sort. You're going to need some fulfillment processes. That means you're going to have to think about how that process works. From day one, you might be very inefficient in how you're packing your parcels and how you're sending them out. After a while, when you start to get a bit of volume, you're going to need to start being much more efficient in how that's done. Time saving is very, very important, especially as you start hitting scale. It's much cheaper to do things efficiently than to have to hire extra people to do things inefficiently, right? It's going to cost you more money that way. You are going to need some people. Again, from day one, that might just be you. It might just be you and your partner. Maybe you and your friends. It might just be you. After a while, you're going to need some people to actually take care of a range of different things. So firstly, the fulfillment processes, actually setting up all of the, the orders, going, picking the products, packing them, putting the labels on them, generating the, 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 the labels, doing the administration, recording the transactions. You're going to also have questions from customers before they buy, problems to deal with after they bought the product and something might have gone wrong. So you're going to have to wear a lot of hats if you're starting on your own in the first place. And that's where a lot of us do start. So that's fine. But Again, you're going to need to think about all those different uh, tasks that have to be done. And you're going to need some money. You may not need a lot, and we'll talk through some of those, those costs generally to give you a rough idea. You may not need a lot to get started in the online space. It's relatively easy, but you are going to need to think about some advertising. If you set up a web store, you're going to have to tell people where it is, how to find it, right? If you're going in a marketplace, every time you sell a product, they're going to charge you a fee. You're going to have to factor that into your profit margins and your, your price calculations for the, uh, for, the, for the products as well. And then your returns budget. You're going to have some products that are going to come back for all sorts of different reasons. Usually it's because there's something wrong with them. Hopefully you're picking products that are not going to be failing or breaking down easily, but be aware that you may have to manage some returns and you might not get some money back for some of those things. Under, underpinning all of that is, of course, a range of business policies that you're going to have to think about. How are you going to treat your customers? How are you going to deal with them? What's the response times? What are the policies for them being able to return or not return products? What warranties do you offer? What arrangements do you have with your upline suppliers? Will they take products back if they're faulty? Do you have to keep them? Do you get a credit? Do you get a refund? Will they repair them? There's a whole bunch of things that you're going to have to think through. And underpinning all of that is, of course, your brand. Who are you? As in, what is your business? How are people going to remember you or your business? How are you going to differentiate that business from everybody else that might have had the same idea or a similar idea to sell similar sorts of products? And so that comes into the, the, the branding and the value proposition of the business. Let's have a look then at some budget modeling. This is not exact numbers. This is just a concept, just to give you a bit of an idea as to some of the different things that you're going to need to think about costing into or budgeting <clears throat> for your business. Now, firstly, whether you're in a physical shop or you're retailing online, you're going to have stock. That's going to cost the same. doesn't matter where you're selling it, really. You're going to have some space that you're going to need. If it's a physical shop, you're going to need a shop front that people can physically walk into. It might have to be a little prettier than a, a warehouse or maybe your garage. It's probably going to cost you a little bit more. You're probably going to have some rent unless you own the property or somebody's kindly donated it to you, very unlikely. 
you're going to have some electricity costs. You're going to have to put up some shop fitting. You might have a point where you will have to have a point of sale method or, or system of some sort to be able to take payments over the counter. In a online store, you probably don't need as much space. You probably don't need as pretty a space. It might not need to be in the expensive suburbs or the shopping areas. It could probably be in the back streets or in the industrial areas or maybe even home. To start with, there's going to be some electricity electricity cost, and you're going to have some technology, of course, to make sure that that store runs. You are going to need to market the business as well. This is something that I think I've spoken to a lot of people about who probably underestimate the amount of marketing that might be required. And so whilst you may not need as much marketing for retailing online as you would in a physical shop, potentially, you are going to need to allocate some money for marketing. And by that, I mean you're going to have costs that will go on every week, every month, every year, continuously. It's not really something you can really stop at any point in time. You're going to have some staff in a physical shop. You're going to have to have those staff in there for all of the uh, available business hours. Even when you take holidays, somebody's still got to be in that shop. With an online business, you might be able to get away with less staff. They might be just you, your friends, your family, so your costs might be slightly cheaper potentially. The one difference between the physical shop and the retailing online scenario is delivery. In a physical shop, the customer takes the product. They are the delivery person. On an online shop, you have to actually get the products to the customer. The idea is if you manage your cost across all of these different product areas or the, all these different cost areas, I should say, then your profit at the end should be what you're looking for. So I hope that helps you to give a little bit of a breakdown. So this all sounds very complex. It's kind of a lot of different moving parts, a lot of different things that you've got to think about to actually get this thing up and running. We got ask the question, is there a shortcut? Is there a faster way to do this? Yeah, there actually is. It's called marketplaces. I'm going to talk a little bit about marketplaces and explain what that opportunity is and how you can get started in that as well. Around 90% of all online shoppers in Australia use marketplaces, online marketplaces. You know those marketplaces as things like eBay, Amazon, Catch, Kogan, My Deal. There's a whole bunch of them out there. I'll show you a few in a minute. And to give you an idea of the size of that sector, Australians uh, two years ago spent around $8.5 billion on marketplaces. 2021, that was. I don't have any later figures at this point in time. But it's a lot of money. It's a fairly substantial amount. And again, you wouldn't mind having a very small percentage of that, right? So it's another place worth having a look at. When I talk about marketplaces, here's a few. You'll probably recognize some of those like eBay, Kogan, Amazon. But there's a couple in there that are a little unusual, like uh, Maya, uh, uh, Bunnings, Chemist Warehouse, Freedom. I mean, th these are physical shops, right? These are retailers. You've been in their stores. How are they a marketplace? You see, that's what's happening. Over the past five or six years in Australia, there's been a big explosion of not just actual standalone marketplaces like Catch, Kogan, eBay, Amazon, and the like. Well, eBay's been here for probably over 25, almost 25 years now, but uh, there's been an explosion of different types of marketplaces, but it's not just a pure marketplace. Many of these are retailers themselves who are understanding and tapping into the idea of what we call the endless aisle, meaning that they can actually bring in products from other vendors, other retailers, offer them to their customers, get a clip on the sale, and the vendor sends the products direct to the customer. It's effectively a glorified um, drop shipping on scale type scenario. And that's how a lot of these operate. So it does provide some opportunity, if you're looking to get into the online space, to actually tap into an audience of another larger retailer who's already paid for that audience, who's already brought that audience to their web stores and allows you to put your products in front of those people. So that's worth looking at too, because you don't really have to advertise in that scenario, do you? The thing with these marketplaces is that not all of them will allow you to just go and create products or listings on their web store and sell those products through their website. There's a couple of marketplaces in Australia that do not require an invitation. You can just go in there, create an account, start listing some products and start selling. There's more than there are than I've got on the screen, but these are the main ones. So you've got Amazon, very well known, eBay, they're both very well known, they've been around a long time, very stable, lots of sales going through each of those. You've got others like Gumtree. It's a bit more of a classified ad sort of thing. They don't actually do transactions on the site. Facebook, much the same, Facebook Marketplace. Uh, Etsy, right down the bottom, relatively small amount of, of traffic compared to the other ones. Uh, Etsy is really more for your handmade 
and uh, very unique sort of products, uh, generally handmade uh, handmade products or, or own brand products. With the two large ones, Amazon and eBay, their traffic is similar. Uh, Amazon at this stage looks like a little more than eBay. But bear in mind that eBay is doing around about $7 billion of products being sold on their website each year. Amazon's currently sitting at about $2 billion, so they're a little bit smaller. It's a lot of visitors with less spend. But also remember that Amazon is also a retailer. So about half of what they sell are their own products, which means that your opportunity as a third-party seller, if you were to sell on Amazon, is around about half of that. So looking at those two, if I was to choose one of those for right now, I would go with eBay because it's got the largest amount of customer spend happening on that platform by around six or seven fold compared to what you would get if you were accessing on Amazon. My actual recommendation would be to go on several marketplaces. Go on both, but don't try and do them both at once. You'll come unstuck. It's, they're complex and they're quite different in how they operate. So pick one, start with one, learn, and then move on from there. So what's the difference then between going on a marketplace and having your own web store? Well, if you go into an online marketplace, you're kind of back in that big shopping center scenario, aren't you? There's a lot of customers around. The customers are already there. The marketplace has spent a lot of money and put a lot of effort into getting customers there so that they can get the money from the sales. So there you are right in the middle, a little, little yellow square, that, that little tiny little uh, one of many retailers within that marketplace space. But there's a lot of customers around, so you've got a much greater chance of actually having some sales, right? You set up your own web store, it's a little more like this. It might be lovely premises but it's in a side street nobody ever heard of. From day one, when you set up your web store, you're going to have to then tell people where it is, how to find it. You're going to have to tell people who you are. You're going to have to advertise and market, and it's going to cost you some money to actually get that those customers to actually find where you are. Nobody knows your URL, your web domain, until you tell them, right? That's the difference. So... On balance, I'd say you're better off to start in a marketplace environment. You might only get a small section of sales, but at least you've got customers that are there that are already looking that you don't need to pay for to get there. You only pay when you sell. So from that point of view, I would generally say a marketplace is a better way to start in the online space. We're told that the average conversion rate for selling on a web store is around about 2%. I did struggle to find some numbers that kind of made sense, but that's where the consensus seemed to be around about there, somewhere between one to three percent, let's say two percent. So it means for every thousand visitors or visits that you get to your website, you're going to need to make anywhere between five to fifty sales, depending on what kind of uh, what kind of conversion rate you get, how well you market the products, what the value proposition is, what your price is, how well they're presented, and so on. There's a whole bunch of factors that go into influencing this this conversion rate. But you're going to have to make a number of sales. And you're going to need to get around about a 1,000 people to make that kind of volume of sales. So ask yourself the question, is that enough for you to live on? Because you might end up needing to get 5,000, 10,000 people to your website in order to make enough for you to actually make the profit you need and move the volume that you need to actually survive and live off the business. Bear that in mind as well. What about the budgeting then? So we talked a bit before about the budget modeling as to the different costs and how they're broken down between physical store and an online store, an online shop. Let's now break that down further and look in the online space as to having your own web store or a or going into a marketplace. As far as setup is concerned on the marketplace, it's free. It doesn't really usually cost you anything. Uh, some of my marketplaces will charge you a monthly fee. I haven't sort of factored that in there, but some of them will charge you a small monthly fee. It's not very, very much, might be 10, 20, 30, $50 or something like that. Uh, but in your own website, you are going to have to pay something to actually get set up. There are solutions out there like Wix, which are which have free offer uh, free offerings. You've got uh, platforms like Shopify that start around thirty dollars, forty dollars a month, which can be fairly inexpensive. Um, so it, it might not cost you a lot, but you're going to you're still going to have to spend some money. At a low end, let's say hundred dollars to get set up. At a mid end, you might spend twenty thousand dollars. We've got clients that spend three, four times that. You, there are other bigger businesses that spend a lot more than that. Again. That's that's for the uh, the bigger businesses to worry about. You're going to need some software. As the software, as far as the your own web store is concerned, can be anywhere from let's say around fifty dollars a month up to a couple of hundred dollars a month. There are platforms that are more expensive. You don't need those when you're getting started. So you're going to sit somewhere in between that space. Your transaction fees, which will need to be charged each time somebody uses a credit or debit card on your site, 
it's going to be around about 3% at the low end, about 2% at the mid end. And of course, the rates sort of come down as you get up into more and more scale. And then you're going to have to advertise. As I said, for your web store, nobody knows where it, where it is. Nobody knows it exists. So you're going to have to actually market that. And that's going to cost you some money in advertising. At the low end, you might be investing around $500 a month. I don't think you really get much response out of anything less than that, to be honest. And at a mid-level, you might need to be spending around $1,500, $2,000, maybe even more per month to really start to drive traffic to that website on a continuous basis. And this is not something that you turn on and then turn off later. It's something you're going to need to do continuously to keep that traffic coming in to make sure that you've got sales uh, happening all the time. The online marketplace, you are going to have higher transaction fees because it's not just the payment that's happening then. The marketplace, marketplace charges you based on success. So instead of paying the money up front, as you do for your own website, you're paying for each time somebody buys something from you, the marketplace takes a clip from that uh, in return for them having brought the customers to you in the first place, effectively a referral fee or a selling fee. Those fees can vary anywhere between about 10 to 20%, depends on which marketplace you're on as to what they're going to charge. They're all different. And sometimes certain categories have higher costs or higher selling fees than others. But as far as the advertising is concerned, I say it's free. The actual technical or correct strategy or best strategy in the marketplaces these days on some of them, especially the big ones like eBay and Amazon, is actually to invest some money in advertising marketing. But I'm not going to go through that strategy today. As far as you're concerned, to just get in front of those customers, it is effectively free. So again, the online marketplace approach is going to be a lot cheaper and a lot easier for you to get started on than it is to actually set up your own web store. I like to think of online marketplaces as retail with training wheels. I remember when you were a kid and learned how to ride a bike for the first time, you might've had those little wheels out the side that sort of stopped you from falling over. Maybe you were natural and just didn't need those, but you get the idea. It's It helps you to get started in retail. And this is the great thing about starting on a marketplace. It's fairly easy to get started. There's low barriers to entry. There's customers already there looking for the products that you're selling. You've just got to put them in front of those customers. You are leveraging existing demand. It's going to be fairly low cost to start and you're only going to pay when you actually sell products. So it's a good way when you sell the product, you've got the money, you take that little bit out, you get a little bit less a little bit less back. Look at your pricing, look at your margins and make sure that you're making profit all the time. I call it structured e-commerce because there's a framework. There are rules, there are policies in place to make you behave a certain way to look after the, the customers of the marketplace. And that is really setting good habits for you when you do run your own web store later on. The other great thing about the marketplaces is that they do have the ability for you to be able to test things and learn very, very quickly. So try different price points and see if it sells or not. Start at a low price, take the price up until it stops selling. Then you know what the right price will be. Sometimes that can be hard to work out what price to charge. Start at a high price and keep coming down until it starts selling however you want to do it, but you can test that sort of thing. You can try different photos. You can try different descriptions. You can try different keywords. You can put things in different categories and you can very, very quickly see by the results and the sales or that you are or aren't getting out of that, whether those strategies are working or not, and you can adjust accordingly. Also, the marketplace does give you pretty good reports uh, and, and metrics back, especially again, eBay and Amazon. Some of the other marketplaces probably not as much, but certainly those bigger sort of free to access marketplaces are going to give you some very good metrics to allow you to really see how your business is going over a period of time and performing and benchmarking, sorry, comparing and benchmarking your business against itself over a period of time as well to see if you're trending up or trending down. And there's also protection programs there, meaning that if the customer does something wrong, uh, tries to commit fraud, you've got protections as a seller, but so do the consumers or the customers as well. They've got protections in case you do something wrong. So like I say, it's those trainer wheels that kind of keep you on the straight and narrow as you're getting started. So I think it's a pretty good case there for getting started on a marketplace. And often that's the strategy that we actually share with our clients as well, even for much bigger multi-million dollar businesses, that if they're looking to get started in the online space, we will say, set up your website, number one, because that's your home base. That's where you own the customer. That's where you can communicate with the customer and completely control and manage that entire customer experience all the way through to checkout and beyond and have them coming back for more. But also go onto a marketplace at the same time because the customers are already there looking. It's going to take time to build up the traffic to your own website. The customer's already on the marketplace. So we use that one-two punch approach to say, do both. 
put the effort into the marketplace, get the sales up, use some of the revenue that comes from that to drive marketing back onto your web store where you can ultimately own the customer. So the dual strategy makes you a multi-channel seller, which pretty much all of our clients are these days. So where do we start? There's a lot of stuff to do there, okay? A lot of opportunities. What really should you focus on? I think there's one key area. In a minute, I'm going to run through a whole stack of questions and, and hopefully they're questions that will help you to work out how you want to set up your business if you're going to set it up online. But the one thing I want to really draw your attention to first is that you're dealing with people, just ordinary people, just like you and me. We go shopping. I shop online all the time. I shop in the physical shops all the time. I have good days, bad days. I get emotional about some things. I don't care about other things. It, we're human, okay? And we have feelings and we have things that rub us the wrong way and things that make us feel better. When we're shopping, our mood can change depending on what we see on the screen. Sometimes we can find what we want very quickly and we feel good because it's what we're looking for. Other times it's a little more challenging and we look at it and it looks good, but then we dig into the details and find it's not going to suit what we look. And so our mood will sort of fluctuate up and down a little bit through that shopping period. We don't give money away until we feel happy. That's the reality. If you feel uncomfortable or you feel unsure, you're not going to put money into the machine because you can't see the person on the other end or the business on the other end, all right? So you give the money away or you, you make the buying decision when you're feeling good. When you're feeling happy, then you spend the money. And then the longer you have to wait before the product arrives, the lower your mood's going to get. And eventually that buyer's remorse starts to set in. It's like, oh, I shouldn't have bought that. Something's going to go wrong. Okay, I don't know if you don't even have to be pessimistic to think, to think like that. It's just the way that we are as humans. The longer you have to wait for it, the worse you're going to feel. So from a seller's point of view, make sure that you get those products out as quick as possible to the customer. They're going to be in a better mood if they get it quickly. Once they get the product, generally their mood's going to go up because that's great. Here it is, opens it up, pulls it out of the box, plugs it in, doesn't work. Of course, that doesn't happen all the time. But you get the idea. The customer can still have their mood affected even after you've got the money and the transaction's long gone and you've sent it out the door ages ago. What you do at that point is going to then determine whether you've got a happy customer or an upset customer. No customer ever starts out grumpy or upset. Generally speaking, you only spend money when you're happy as a customer, as a human. So if the experience after they've got that physical product is not so good, you're going to have to put some effort in with customer service to win them back. They already trusted you once. They already gave you the money. They'd be happy to give you more money if you look after them, but you've got to look after them at that point. Don't just take the money and drop. It. So understand that your customers are going to be one of your best assets and your best resources. If they like what you give them, they like what they buy from you, and you've got other products that they can buy from or that they can buy, then they're going to come back and buy from you again. And that's the best sort of business you can possibly get, repeat business. So here's a couple of questions that might help you perhaps in your planning stages. I could talk about this for hours. So think firstly, are you going to be doing this alone or with other people? Cost-wise, it might be better to do it on your own because you know, not have to worry about so much. Maybe you can get along with other people. Maybe you can't. Maybe you've got a friend or a family member that might sort of help you from time to time. But I will say one thing, that uh, it's better to work with somebody else, even if you're just checking in with them every now and again, because you're going to get more perspectives or wider perspectives or better uh, considerations from discussion with another person than you will just by relying on the thoughts in your own head. What type of product should you sell? I'd suggest start with something that you're interested in or that you know a bit about. If you like the outdoors, look for products related to the outdoors. If you like cars, look at something related to car parts or accessories or things like that. So start somewhere where you, at least you have an interest. There's nothing worse than going being in a business for several years to find yourself having to get up every morning to do something you really don't enjoy. That's not really fun. You're setting up your own business. Make it something that you're actually going to enjoy. What price point do you need to achieve so you can look after your customers well? This was an important question that I asked myself when I set up a business many years ago selling studio lighting equipment for photography studios. If you're selling one, two, three, four, five dollar items, how much profit are you making in that? Probably only a dollar, 50 cents, two dollars maybe, very small amounts. And you're going to have to do lots of those transactions to actually make the money that you need to survive on in terms of an income. 
how nice can you be to a customer for 50 cents? Really? You just want to take that money and move on to the next one because time is money, right? So have a think about the price point that you're going going for. Don't go for like a $10,000 price point. You might find that very hard to sell. You might only sell one every couple of months. But find a price point that makes sense. Maybe it's a $20, $30, $40, $50 sort of thing. So you've got a $5, or a $10, $20, or $30 profit margin in it so that if something does go wrong, you can afford to take the time to be nice to the customer and to win them back. Otherwise, it can get very, very frustrating, particularly with low-priced products. Where are you going to get your products from? You're going to make them yourself by handmade? You're going to manufacture them over in China and have them imported? Are they going to be brand products that you're getting from a local distributor? Are you going to import the same products from overseas as grey imports because you're allowed to in Australia? So there's a lot of different options that you have, and each comes with its own pros and cons. So do your research. Think about the products you're going to bring in. Don't worry about bringing in 50 or 100 products to begin. Start small. Start with a small number and then gradually build to it as your business grows. Are you going to be purchasing goods to resell, stocking them in your own warehouse or your own place? Or are you going to be ordering just in time or drop shipping? Drop shipping means that you take the money from the customer, you send the order to the vendor, the vendor sends the product to the customer. That's called drop shipping. Just in time ordering means that you take the money from the customer, you order it from the supplier, they send it to you, and then you send it out to the customer a day later. Each of these business models has pros and cons. Having the goods ready for you to actually sell straight or sorry, send straight out to the customer is usually the best and the safest. However, it means you're going to have to carry some stock. It's going to cost you some money. It's going to take some space. Ordering just in time is slower because you've got to get it to come to you and then you've got to send it out. So there can be a delay in that. And with drop shipping, you sometimes won't have any visibility on how many products the customer, sorry, the vendor actually has in stock. And there is a risk of overselling. And secondly, the way that the vendor actually sends the products out to the customers might not really be in line with your brand. And it might not be the experience you want your customers to have, but you'll have very little control over that. So again, pros and cons in each of these things to consider. Whatever products you're going to sell, are there any safety standards, any laws, regulations that apply to those products? For electrical products, obviously, there's safety standards and, and uh, uh, laws that apply to, to that. If they're child products, baby products, or things like that, there's obviously safety standards that apply. So be aware of what those are. Go and look them up if you're not sure. Go and get advice. <clears throat> what cost are you going to have for importing products if they're coming from overseas or what supply supply cost are you going to have? So the price from the vendor is one thing, but you're going to have delivery costs to your premises as well. Are you going to have direct competitors? The answer to that is probably yes, because there's not too many products today that other people haven't already thought of or aren't already selling. But what are those competitors like? Can you compete on the price? Can you compete on the quality or the service? You generally can't compete on all three, all right? But you might choose to compete on quality and service and have a slightly higher price because some customers will prefer that. You might compete on price, but you may not be able to offer as good quality or as good service, for example. So you've got to make a bit of a, a decision about what your brand is and who the customers are that you're trying to reach. Most importantly, will you be able to make a profit? Because if you can't, it kind of defeats the purpose of doing the whole thing, right? What sales volume do you need with that profit to be able to pay yourself an income that's going to actually get you by in life, never mind becoming a millionaire? You've got to get to that point before you can sort of scale the business any further. So what sales volume to, do you need? Be very clear about what that, that point is so that you know when you get to it, you can then move to the next phase. Otherwise, you can spend several years just chasing your tail, selling products and really not making that much, and that can really get tiresome very, very quickly. Are you going to sell on marketplaces or a web store or maybe both? How are you going to attract customers to your web store if you are selling on your own web store? What budget are you going to need to spend on marketing and search engine optimization to actually drive customers to that web store? <clears throat> are your products going to be more prone to breakage or faults? Electrical products probably have more of a propensity to actually have faults. Glass and delicate products might have more, uh, more chance of breaking perhaps in shipping or postage, how many returns are you going to be dealing with as a result for that? How are you going to pack the orders, whether they're sensitive or breakable products or whether they're robust products, but they already come in a box. Is that box strong enough? Do you have to buy other boxes and packaging or bubble wrap to actually protect them whilst in transit? I don't mean to put courier drivers down, but sometimes they're in such a rush, they're not really paying that much care to how each individual parcel is being looked after. 
And plus they can't really see what's inside each box either. So be aware that your products maybe have, have a little bit of rough and tumble as they're getting going on their way to the customer. Who's going to deliver the products to your customers? It might be intuitive to say, well, just take it to the local post office. That's okay, but that's not really scalable after you start hitting some numbers. So are you going to have a courier come and pick them up from you? Which courier is that going to be? Australia Post, Toll, Star Trek? There's a whole bunch of them out there. So do your research. There are some good aggregators out there, shipping aggregators that will allow you to tap into rates for some of the big courier companies without you needing to have your own account. That can be a very good way to start. So companies like Sendle, Ship It, Star Ship It, there's a whole bunch of them out there that you can have a look at as well. How much space are you going to need to put your stock? How much space are you going to need to actually pick and pack your orders and send them out the door and store them until the courier comes and picks them up? Need some space for that, right? How many returns realistically should you be expecting? And how are you going to manage those returns? Will the vendor give you credit and trust that you've got it? Will they tell you to throw it out and just give you credit on the next one? Will they ask you to send it back to them? Is that going to cost you more money? You need to factor in what that process is so that you know when it happens, there's no surprises and you don't get upset. What software are you going to use to manage your inventory, your sales, printing your consignment labels, tracking the orders and so on? And what product data and images are you going to need to create in order to actually convey the value and the information about the products to your customers, whether it's on a marketplace or on a web store? What you want to do is you really want to invest what you have most of. When you're starting a business, you might have less money, so you're going to have to invest more time. If you're lucky enough to have more money to invest in the business, you might be able to spend a little less time, but you're definitely going to have to spend some money. And that's kind of the way that the two things work. So invest what you have most of, and put that effort in and it will pay off in the long run. I don't know if you're any good with the spreadsheet or not. I don't know whether looking at a screen like that makes you your eyes glaze over and want to sort of shut the computer down or shut the video down straight away. I don't know. But uh, data is the secret source of e-commerce. You can't have e-commerce. You cannot be selling products online without product data. When we say product data, what we mean is the information about the products that your customers are buying or looking at. If you walk into a physical store, the salesperson can pull something off the shelf, give it to you, and without a word being spoken, you can instantly see how heavy it is, what color it is, how big it is. You can see if it's going to fit or not. You can see if you like it or not. You can, you can turn it around, look at it in all, all directions. No words needed. But in the online space, you need to be able to Show, replicate that experience to the customer. And the way to do that is with data, that is information about the product, all the attributes so that you know, or the customer knows what, it, what, they're get, what they're getting, what they're looking at, and obviously good quality images as well. So even if you're not great with spreadsheets, you're going to have to get used to putting the product into a database or a spreadsheet of some sort to be able to arrange it, go through and look at your pricing, work out your margins, make sure that the descriptions are okay, because if they're not, you're not going to get that traffic that you need either to your website or to a marketplace store. It's really all about structuring that data. So it, it, it might look a little confusing at the start, but if I show it to you like this, then hopefully this makes sense. You see, on the left, we have what we call unstructured data. It's information. That's all data is. Data is just information. But it's unstructured in the sense that it's just a series of paragraphs. If you read that, you'll understand what the product is. But the computer, when it looks at that, has no idea which words are important, which ones aren't. I know AI is getting smarter and it's going to continue to get smarter, but at the end of the day, still, you can read that as a human and understand it. A computer is going to struggle to serve up your product in the right search results if that's the only data that you've got. And so what it's about, what, what it's all about is structuring the data like it is on the right into a series of fields or attributes, manufacturer, model, type, origin color, price, weight, dimensions, all of those sorts of things. So that the computer, when I say the computer, I mean the search engines, the marketplaces can actually serve your products up and provide the information to the customer that they're looking for to make their purchasing decision. There's a range of specific data points that you'll need to be thinking about. Don't want to get too complex in this. That's a topic for another day. You need to include all the relevant keywords that the customers are likely to think of in their own heads. So remember that bike and bicycle both mean the same thing, but they're two entirely different words, spelled entirely differently. So you need to include both, right? Laptop and notebook, again, two different words. Television and TV. Now, TV is just two letters, I know, but they both mean the same thing. But we write about them in different ways. People will search for one and not the other. People will search for the other and not the one. 
So you need to be able to make sure that you've captured all of those keywords that the customers are likely to think of in their own head because they're not browsing. They come up with an idea in their head, they go looking for it, and that's when they need to find your product. So you've got to be ready with those keywords. Make sure that your products are put into to the right categories, whether it's on Google Shopping, whether it's on your website for navigation, whether it's on the marketplace. If it's not in the correct category, it will tend to get demoted in search results on both Amazon and eBay and any of these marketplaces and Google, and you will not find yourself with as many people looking at the product and therefore less sales. If you have products that come in variations such as color or size, create those listings in the way that the marketplace tells you to. Provide all the relevant attributes. Don't leave anything out. If it's got color, country of origin, material, type, size, all of those attributes include as much information as possible. It will give you more chances of that product being found. If you're selling parts for vehicles, bikes, cars, appliances, whatever it happens to be, make sure that you're applying fitment, which means that you're actually saying in your descriptions, either in a structured way or at least in the text description, which models those particular parts fit so that the customer has high confidence that they got the right part. Always provide the brand, the barcode if the product has one and a manufacturer part, name, uh, part number if there is one, of course. Set a competitive price as best you can. You do not have to be the cheapest to sell online. You need to have a fair price, but it needs to be competitive. So you can't just simply price your products at double the price of everybody else and expect that somebody's going to buy that. They generally won't. Offer free delivery where you can. Free delivery is not really free delivery. Of course, nobody's going to actually deliver your products, take them from your premises and send them to the customer or take them to the customer for free. The reality is that delivery is a necessary part of the cost structure of e-commerce, which means that if you can build that cost into the price of the product, you may serve your customer better. Think about it. If I say the product is $48.50 plus $12.95 shipping, can you work that out in your head? Sorry, too late. Next. I can't work that out in my head in that sort of time frame. But if I told you the product was $56.28 and I looked at the product and I said $56, oh, that's fair. I don't have to think about the shipping. I don't have to do any maths in my head. I just look at the price and I go, it's either fair or it's not. It's much, much easier for the customer to work it out that way. So where you can offer free shipping, do it, build it into the price of the product or add it to the price of the product where you can. Now, it's going to depend on the type of product as to whether that can be done or not. If you're selling party supplies, most people aren't going to come in and buy one plate, one plate or one napkin. They're going to be buying things in bulk. And they're probably not just going to buy the plates, they're going to buy the cups and the, the, the forks and knives and some napkins as well. So if you build in the price of shipping one of those products or one of those packs of products to the customer, then by the, by the time the customer's added all of those products to check out, they're going to be paying too much shipping. And they're going to see that price and they're going to go, it's, it's too much. So in that sort of scenario where customers are buying multiple products from you, I'd be inclined to say, do not include the cost of shipping in it. Make the products the actual price that you need, need them to be. And then just put a shipping amount on the end based on the weight, the volume, maybe a flat rate, however you want to do it. If you're selling products that are larger, you're going to find that you won't be able to put free delivery on them either because the cost of sending a fridge within Melbourne to another place in Melbourne is going to be much cheaper than sending it from Melbourne to the other side of the country, right? You're not going to be able to build one cost into that because it's going to vary so much. Generally speaking, anything up to around about three to five kilos, you can put into a flat rate satchel with most carriers or Australia Post and send it pretty much anywhere in the country for one fixed price. And so in though that scenario, depending again on whether it's one of those multi-buy type of things or a product that somebody would buy on its own, have a think about whether you can include the cost of shipping in there as well. It definitely is better if you can. Have a think about your returns policy and particularly a change of mind policy. A change of mind is not required by law in Australia. Uh, however, what that means is if the customer does change their mind, you may offer them a refund, whether it's a partial refund or a full refund. You certainly are required to offer a refund where the product is not arrived in the condition you said it would be. So maybe it's arrived damaged, maybe it doesn't work, maybe there's a fault with it. You are obligated by law to cover that. But a change of mind policy can also be a competitive advantage. And certainly marketplaces like eBay and Amazon are all over this and have found that it increases the number of sales where there is a change of mind return policy for the customer, it just lowers that risk for the customer buying. Use marketing to attract potential customers, especially uh, if you have a website. But even if you're on the marketplace, look into what advertising and marketing options there are for you to use and to tap into on that marketplace as well. And of course, display high quality images because images do really speak a thousand words and the better quality images, 
the better the customers are going to feel about the product that they're looking at. So specifically on images, for e-commerce, square images only. Google requirements are 800 by 800 pixels. That's the minimum size for Google Shopping to accept. Anything below that, you won't get into Google Shopping. Most marketplaces are going to require uh, pictures around that sort of size as well. Uh, Amazon's uh, recommendation is 1,000 by 1,000 pixels. In some countries, that is mandatory. So we always say 1,000 by 1,000 pixels square is the ideal size. It's not too big that it will slow down your website loading, but it's big enough that it will meet the criteria for all marketplaces and online, play, uh, online venues that you're going to be advertising and promoting your products. Definitely have multiple images. Of course, if you only show one image, the customer's only looking on one side, but they're about to buy a three-dimensional mm -hmm. product, I would assume, unless it's a card or something like that, like it, that literally is only two-dimensional. Uh, but you want multiple products to show the product to show the customer all angles of that product. Let them look at the front, the back, the top, the side. If it's a product that the size can be hard to work out, put something next to the, the uh, product in the photo to give an indication of the size. Maybe hold it in your hand to show the size if it's a small item, for example, because customers can't really gauge that just by looking at uh, the product on its own. Take your own photos if you can. Now, you might be lucky enough to have photos given to you by a supplier. That's great. But if not, you're going to have to take your own. And even if you are given photos by the supplier, they may not be terribly good quality or they might be fairly small. But one thing's for sure, everybody else that's getting those same products from that same supplier are using the same images. Where's your point of difference? So taking your own photos with your own angles, with your own equipment, different angles, different types of photos is going to draw people's attention to your products as opposed to everybody else. And that's especially true in the marketplaces. Make sure that they're high resolution. Don't take them small resolution photos. Make sure they're full resolution. Uh, full product image. Uh, most of the marketplaces will require that you have a photo like the one on the right there of the actual product, the whole product, nothing but the product, okay? Just with white space around the background. No graffiti, meaning no borders, no, no logos, no banners, no text or anything over the image. Uh, you'll see a little bit of that on some marketplaces, especially places like eBay uh, and some of the overseas marketplaces have a lot of that graffiti on there. Uh, I know why the sellers do it. I've spoken to plenty of them, but it's not a good idea. And the algorithms on those marketplaces and those platforms are smart enough to detect it and they will demote your listings and you will not get as many visitors. So you're better off to keep them absolutely clean. Plus, they'll be fine for every channel that you want to sell on. And if you're allowed to have video, think about having, having video in there as well. Whether that, whether that video is about how to use the product, how to assemble the product, how to use it in a certain way, how to fix it if something goes wrong, those things all add value to the customer and provide the customer more reassurance when they're shopping that this is a good product to buy because look at all the information I've gotten, all the things that the, the merchant has tried to help me with. But at the end of the day, the product that they see online on the computer screen is actually really just a theory. Until they actually have that product physically in their hands right in front of them, they don't know what they're going to get, really. They're trusting, okay? And so, as we say, the transaction is just the beginning. At the beginning, what you say about the product, the information you provided about it, the, the photos that you've provided about it are really only put to the test when that product actually arrives at the doorstep of the customer that's bought it. So everything really rests on that delivery. Everything rests on the delivery from the point of view of how quick it is, how nicely it's delivered, how it's packaged. Is it in a box that comes damaged? When they open it up, is it damaged? Is it rattling around inside? So you've got to be thinking about how you're packing those products to make sure that when it arrives on the doorstep of the customer, that it's in good condition, exactly as you describe the product and exactly fulfilling that promise that they saw on the computer or the, or the mobile phone screen when they were shopping. So you got started. You are maybe on a marketplace or two, maybe you're on a web store. How do you then scale your business? From day one, you can probably do a lot of it yourself, yes. But there'll come a point, and there should definitely come a point, should always be your ambition to grow the business to a point where you can actually earn enough profit to be able to pay somebody else to run it and go and live the life that you want to live. So how do you scale the business? It can be tough if you have to pay for absolutely everything, of course. It can be tough if you have to do everything yourself, and sometimes in the early stages you will have to. But think about outsourcing some aspects of your business because you can. There are services around like Upwork, Freelancer or Fiverr, and there's a whole bunch more as well that will that have scores of people, hundreds, thousands of people from all around the world in different countries that might be have less uh, lower pay rates than perhaps here in Australia, where they are quite happy to do a lot of the tasks that are not location dependent. So they can't physically pack your products and send them out to the customer, but they can generate the consignment labels for you. They can create the 
the product information and structure the data that you get from your suppliers to list it up on a marketplace or onto your web store. They can answer questions online that you receive via email or live chat through your web store or through the marketplace. These things, it doesn't matter where they are. They can be anywhere in the world. As long as they can speak the local language, as long as they can communicate well, as long as they can respond well, uh, then these are ways that you can extend the capabilities of your, of your business at a much lower cost and saving yourself time in the process. So have a look at how you can how you can extend your budget by outsourcing some aspects of your business, administration, bookkeeping, recording, metrics, reporting, market investigation. There's a whole bunch of different things that can actually be done if you think about it. When you get to the point that you're scaling your business and wanting to go into multiple channels, you're going to need to start thinking a little more seriously about what kind of technology you're using to do that because you will not be able to do it in your head. You will not be able to do it in spreadsheets and you cannot do it by having to log into 20 different platforms every day. You'll go crazy. You will need to unify or to bring together all of the different aspects of that online business into a central dashboard or at least a few dashboards that you can actually manage. And what I've got on the screen there is a bunch of different software solutions. I'm not going to go through those. I just want to simply show that there is a whole lot of options out there. This is a space that is big dollars. This is a space that is that is very lucrative. And there's a lot of businesses out there that have come up with some amazing solutions to make sure that you can actually run an online business in a very, very efficient way. So down the left side, you've got the website, the website platform, the shopping cart. So you can see platforms there like Shopify and Wix that I mentioned before. Uh, generally, my recommendation would be to go for a cloud platform rather than a self-hosted one. There are some circumstances when self-hosting makes sense. When you're getting started is not one of them. And whilst WooCommerce and WordPress are cheap and easy, in fact, they're free to actually download, the you will need to have a degree of technical knowledge and understanding, and you will need to be needing to be pay some, paying some costs for the hosting and the maintenance and upkeep of those platforms in order to keep them going. It's not a distraction you want when you're starting a business off. So I'd go, I'd say go with one of the cloud platforms, which means it's all done for you. It's all looked after. You just pay a flat fee each month to keep that business running. On the right, you've got all the different marketplaces where you can actually go and sell. So website marketplaces. And in the middle, you've got a whole bunch of middleware solutions that actually talk between the two different channels or the, or the multiple channels that you're actually playing on. Uh, you might know some of those, you might not. The ones that we've got at the top there, Neto and Zealous Connect. Zealous Connect is our, uh, our platform, our unified commerce platform. These ones actually really are a website and a PIM or a product information management service all in the one. So there's, again, some benefits for that. And most of our clients are actually on one of those two platforms. We've also got some that are on Shopify, BigCommerce, WooCommerce, Adobe Commerce Cloud. We, we, they're all over, all over the place. But when you get to that point in time, there's a lot of information out there. Do your research and choose carefully and make sure that the information that you get or the, the, the solution that you choose is actually going to suit your business the way that you need it to grow. Always remember, success is a team sport. Don't try and do it all in isolation. I love the fact that there, there are videos out there like this. There are other people out there that are sharing a lot of great tips on how to run a business online or any sort of business. Make the most of those, but talk to other people. When you go to events, don't just listen to the speakers up on the platform. Talk to the people that are also attending and find out what they do with their business. You will get so much information just by talking to other people and finding out what they've done and how they've done their businesses, what the challenges are and how they've overcome them. It's one of the greatest things that you can possibly do for your business. But find a mentor, find somebody else that's in a similar category or perhaps doing the same thing as you, but maybe selling different products and just keep in touch because you're going to learn a lot more through the collective wisdom and experience of a lot of people rather than just trying to do it all on your own. That's about all that I want to go through. So to conclude, to, to conclude where do you get more help? Well, you can watch this over as many times as you like, of course. But if you want to go into some marketplaces, I've put two up here on the screen uh, as to two places that you can go to get information about eBay and Amazon. I put those up. There are more, but I put those two up because those are both uh, free for you to go and actually set up uh, an, an eBay store or an Amazon store on. You can get started on that without having to ask anybody. And so they're really the, the place that you're going to start. Other marketplaces are out there. Just go and do a Google search for any of the other marketplaces if you want to. But remember, most other marketplaces, you're going to need consent or approval to list on their marketplace. So you can't just walk in there and start listing. So go to the eBay Seller Center, go to sell.amazon.com.au and read up the information that they've got there before you get started. Make sure you understand their fees. Make sure you understand their rules. And if you do, you'll set yourself up in a really good way. 
Another place you can get help, of course, is social media. It can be a little bit of a minefield in the sense that sometimes you have people with vested interests perhaps trying to push a particular way rather than other. I've tried not to do that today. Uh, so, by, but, but do reach out to those different channels. Uh, you'll find lots of good videos on YouTube. Again, pay attention to who you're listening to and the information you've been given that it actually makes sense and that it's credible and, it, and it, it, it's from a person that's had experience doing it. On Facebook, don't just go out and ask general strangers how to run business because they're going to give you all sorts of opinions. Go and join the groups, the Facebook groups that are actually dealing with business, online businesses. An eBay Sellers Australia group, which is extremely good, around 7,000 members in that. If you ask questions in that, you'll generally get very, very good answers back and a lot of help. And LinkedIn is another place really that's worth looking at as well. If you don't have a LinkedIn profile, you can kind of be a bit of a stalker. That's okay. Just create a, a free profile, but go and actually follow groups and follow people that are sharing information that can actually help you to accelerate and grow in your business as well. So thanks very much for watching. I hope that's been really useful for you today. If you do have any questions or you'd like to follow up and get some more information about any of this, you're most welcome to get in touch with me. You can uh, message in the comments below. Uh, my details are up on the screen. You can go and message me anytime through social media, or you can jump onto our website and send us a message and just ask for Tim, and I'll get in touch with you and, and try and answer as much as I possibly can. All the best with your online business getting started. I hope to see you again soon.